Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Mitigating Cardiovascular Healthcare Disparities, Current State on the Science for Lipid Management. Your host for today, Capri King, will now begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to our disparities in cardiac health practices, as well as our cardiac land practices and any other practices that have joined our call today. We are in for a treat. Uh, we will be discussing the current state of um, the science for lipid management, and I'd like to go ahead with a couple of announcements, program announcements, before we get started with our speaker. Uh, Emily, could you please pass the ball to me? You have the ball. You might just have to left-click the slide first. Thank you very much. Uh, for our announcements, we're excited to announce that we are now on Twitter. MPRO has a Twitter account, and our handle is at MPROcares. So feel free to tweet us. Feel free to follow us on Twitter and get some of the exciting tweets that will be coming forth from our prevention land, our cardiac land, our cardiac disparities program, and many of our other programs here at MPRO. Check your email inbox for the December newsletter, which will be coming out shortly after the Thanksgiving holiday. It's to have some exciting information about the new development with uh, the American Heart Association recommendation for blood pressure control. It's not too late to submit your quarter three data for the Disparities in Cardiac Health Program. If you need assistance with data pool, please email dash at impro.org to request help. And a big thank you to all of the practices that have submitted data for quarter three. Impro will host a Meaningful Youth Stage 2 workshop. It will be December 4th from 8 a.m. to noon. If you're interested in attending that workshop, you can email dash at impro.org to request more information. The Disparities in Cardiac Health Program will host Heart Health 101 workshop at the Bowen Branch Library, which is one of the Detroit libraries, on December 14th at 10.30 a.m. It's open to the public, and this is something that we encourage our physician practices to promote to their patients. Today's presenter is Dr. Patrice Davine Nickens, who is a medical officer at the Heart Failure and Arrhythmias Branch at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Dr. David Nickens is a medical officer at NHLBI, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. David Nickens is an experienced clinical trialist and is the project officer for the arterial thrombosis intervention in metabolic syndrome with low HDL high triglycerides impact on global health, aim high. Dr. Nickens has managed trials in acute coronary syndromes, heart failure, diabetes, and revascularization, cardiac surgery, and use of left ventricular assist devices in advanced heart failure. She is particularly interested in disparities in the practice of medicine and cardiovascular health. We'd like to thank Dr. Davine Nickens for being our presenter today. And I will pass the ball to you, Dr. Nickens. Thank you, Todd Cipri. Okay. So I'm just um, trying to advance the slide. Do you have your slide presentation clicked at the top left? Okay. Let's see. Share. Okay. I don't see. I could see your slide set to free.
Um, I don't see. There we go. So you should be able to advance from that point forward. Next click. Okay, full screen. Let's see. So I have full screen, but I still am not advancing. There we go. Okay. Um, well, um, again, Tapri, thank you so much for the introduction, and it's really my um, pleasure to be here and to share um, and talk about the uh, new uh, just-released ACC AHA guidelines on cholesterol therapy. Um, first, um, I'd like to begin by underscoring the importance of atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, cardiovascular disease represents the largest burden to the American public despite substantial reductions in, health in death rates since the 1960s. Research elucidating disease-causing risks and subsequent treatments has and continues to offer an opportunity to reduce cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or ASCVD, is, the, is a major component of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, the prevention of or reducing the risk of atherosclerotic heart disease as an, is an important strategy for reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality related health care costs and protecting the longevity and quality of life of all Americans. So today's objective is to review the disease burden of heart disease with particular emphasis on safe sex, race, and ethnic differences and disparities in care. Um, then for the last half of the uh, presentation, I want to talk about the new guidelines. Um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease prevention through risk reduction is a major um, aspect of the new um, guidelines. Lifestyle is the foundation for risk reduction, and uh, interestingly um, and importantly, statin therapy um, will reduce risk. Um, I will also talk a little bit about um, what to expect for future updates. So um, the purpose of this slide is to, um, which displays the rapid rise of death due to cardiovascular disease since the, the beginning of the 20th century. You'll notice the decline since 1960. We'd like to think that in part is due to the advances in medicine. Um, life expectancy um, has, um, has really uh, improved over time, and at the last um, uh, review, we find that um, the total life expectancy at birth is um, up to 78, degree, 78 years of age. However, if you're um, a female, that number is 80, and if you're a male, that's lower, uh, 75 years. However, if you are uh, black, then your life expectancy is, uh, is uh, or survival is shortened. So death rates for heart disease is an important measure of how we're doing, and you can see that across the age um, span uh, or lifespan that um, blacks have the highest death rate. Um, higher than whites, and that's at every age group. You'll notice the other minorities are similar or, or have um, a lower um, heart disease death rate than whites. Um, this slide is to underscore that since 1983, the number of deaths in women have exceeded the number of deaths in men. Um, in this slide, depicting hypertension by race, ethnicity, and sex, um, one can see that African Americans or blacks 
have the highest prevalence the percent of the population with um, hypertension. And although there is a decrease in time with treatment, which is, um, you know, um, what we'd like to see for all populations, you can see that this high prevalence and, um, and that the, the high prevalence continues, and so the reduction is slower in this uh, highly prevalent population compared to whites and even Mexican-Americans. So looking at the disease burden of uh, cardiovascular disease by sex or gender, you can see how important this is a life risk for CVD at any age. You can see that men um, have a, have a uh, increased risk compared to women at uh, age 40. However, if you look at the numbers of deaths and percentage of prevalence in populations, you can see that for, for um, most categories of heart disease, uh, with the exception of coronary heart disease, um, women actually are, have higher rates or are at, at disadvantage. And uh, coronary disease, as you can see, 8.3% versus 6.1%, or you can see the difference in the number of deaths, um, almost 300,000 per year. But nevertheless, the burden of cardiovascular disease in women is, is substantial. And again, here is the risk factor burden by sex you'll see that women have a slightly lower um, uh, risk than men for hypertension, but diabetes, total cholesterol, physical inactivity, um, and, and um, are, are both um, greater than men with some decrease in obesity and smoking. So, um, uh, this slide is just to um, underscore that um, after that, that the number of women or the prevalence of CVD by sex is uh, for women jumps after menopause and the excess uh, compared to men begins after age 75. So in the next slide, I want to underscore this differences and disparities. So there are two very important Institute of Medicine reports, or three Institute of Medicine reports that um, actually underscore sex and gender differences, and also race and race and ethnic disparities. And um, I think that the um, the take home message here is that while there are differences in clinical appropriateness and need and patient preferences that may account for some differences in care. The healthcare system um, issues like bias, um, stereotyping, and uncertainty are also part of the um, issues that physicians and patients um, um, have uh, these interactions such that um, minorities and women sometimes are receiving less aggressive, not appropriate care. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to review um, studies that looked at this in, um, in, in very carefully. Um, the first is racial disparity uh, specifically in cholesterol treatment. In this study, uh, physicians and medical practices with high numbers of prescriptions for coronary artery disease medications were invited to participate in a quality assurance program. Medical records were reviewed from a random sample of patients with coronary artery disease from 1995 to 1998. The data related to the detection, treatment, and control of this epidemia were abstracted from the medical record and evaluated in cross-sectional stratified and logistic regression analyses using generalized estimation equations. The study compared the findings in blacks compared to whites. So what were the findings? African Americans were younger, were likely to be women and to have diabetes, heart failure, and hypertension. Low density lipoprotein cholesterol, or LDLC, testing rates for Caucasian men was, was um, over 1.4 times higher than that for, American, for African American women and about 1.3 higher, um, times higher than that for African American men. 
almost 60% of tested Caucasian men and less than half to, uh, of tested African Americans will prescribe lipid lowering drugs. So clearly 60 or 50 are unacceptable, but the disparity um, is also important to note. And uh, tested and treated Caucasian men have the highest LDL uh, goal attainment compared to the lowest um, in African American um, um, men, uh, 35 compared to 21%. But this is just an example, and I think the conclusions of this study is very important, that increased lipid testing is clearly needed for at-risk groups. Improvements in treatment and control are also necessary to eliminate racial disparities in lipid management. And um, uh, there was a call for additional research, and this, was, this is an older study, but disparities in treatment and goal attainment must be better understood and reflected in policy to improve health of underserved populations. And I think this difference, um, uh, the issue of disparities in treatment and goal attainment is something that may be addressed in the new guidelines. But let's look at another example. So in this case, this is a study looking at lipid therapy among um, veterans with diabetes and dyslipidemia. So the methods in this study was a cross-sectional study of veterans serviced by the VA um, and the time period was uh, in 2006. The patients had both diabetes and hyperlipidemia compared um, all female um, patients to age and facility matched males. Uh, so um, the proportions of patients with any prescription for lipid lowering therapy were compared to those with elevated low density lipoprotein cholesterol. Um, and patients with no prior treatment and initiation of lipid therapy was also reviewed. So multiple logistical regression was applied to estimate the odds ratio to the AOR and the confidence interval adjusting for race, VA eligibility, healthcare utilization, cardiovascular diseases, mental health conditions, and comprehensive list of other comorbidities. Um, and this was also stratified by age. But the findings, um, you know, again, are important that women who had higher LDLC levels than men, they were less likely to receive lipid lowering therapy or to be initiated on such therapy. The difference is the greatest in youngest women for both lipid or um, any lipid lowering therapy and initiation of therapy. Adjustment for potential co-founders did not change the risk of estimates. So once again, this is a very important study where women in a veteran's uh, system, so there's no issue of access to care here, but women with diabetes and hyperlipidemia receive less aggressive lipid lowering therapy than men, especially among younger women at, at other age groups. And, and, and of course, this is very um, uh, disconcerting because early intervention to control hyperlipidemia can reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease among these women. Um, moving on to the uh, Get Into the Guidelines program, which is a quality improvement program that has been sponsored by the ACC. Um, and um, in this uh, very large study, um, and specifically to address disparities in application of evidence-based treatment guidelines for women and the elderly, um, over uh, 200,000 patients hospitalized with CAD were evaluated in the uh, Get With the Guidelines coronary artery disease programs. And the period of observation here was from 2002 to 2007. They looked at a number of measures, including lipid lowering medication use. Over time, the composite adherence on these measures increased from 86 to 97.4 percent. That's really uh, remarkable. Um, there was a slight difference in the composite adherence by sex that remained significant over time, um, and this was confined to patients less than 75 years. But um, the important conclusion here was that quality improvement programs like Get to the Guidelines do improve adherence to, um, to uh, treatment guidelines for all subgroups. So these quality improvement programs may be very important in the reduction of health disparities. So talking about elimination of, of uh, treatment disparities is a perfect segue to talk about the new uh, guidelines for cholesterol therapy. The new guidelines focus on atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk reduction um, and will treat 
um, and the goal is to treat patients at risk and uh, so that they will benefit. Um, the attention to risk reduction heretofore it has been undervalued, and um, it's thought this would be very helpful for underserved groups, especially women and minorities. Previous cholesterol targets, whether screening for initiation or goal intended, uh, tended to exclude groups. Uh, the simple algorithms of uh, the new guidelines and emphasis on healthy lifestyle is easy for both patient and provider to understand and leads to a satisfactory intervention um, interaction and hopefully good adherence. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the background leading up to the new guidelines. So the previous cholesterol guideline was last released um, by the ATP3 group in 2001, and it was updated in 2004. Its approach is very comprehensive. It's also quite complex. Uh, beginning in 2008, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, or NHLBI, initiated new guidelines uh, by sponsoring the usual rigorous systematic evidence reviews. In 2011, responsive to a um, uh, 2010 uh, an Institute of Medicine report, which focused um, um, which questioned our, how well are guidelines serving us, um, and in response to the uh, the uh, uh, process at NHLBI was to focus on only the highest quality evidence, and there was also uh, a uh, suggestion and, and as a result an outreach to partner with other organizations, um, specifically ACC and AHA. Um, we should also note that this uh, very rigorous review process only considered evidence up until 2011. Um, later, except if it's uh, mentioned in the methods section, uh, later data is not part of these guidelines, and they have already planned to um, begin the up updates in 2014. So these new guidelines are limited in scope but they are based on the highest quality evidence available, clinical data available, randomized trials, meta-analyses of the same, and observational studies. And when there was no evidence, there is no recommendation. Uh, the uh, the uh, guidelines look somewhat different. They're not so lengthy. The uh, text to support the recommendation is very uh, uh, crisp. The format is changed. Uh, largely because the recommendations are mapped from the, an NHLBI grading format to the ACC AHA class of recommendation or level of evidence. The alignment between these systems is imperfect. But nevertheless, these uh, 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 guidelines were released only after independent expert review and scientific review and approval by all of the partners or each of the partners and also an endorsement by the professional groups. Uh, conflicts of interest, uh, specifically relationships with industries, are dis uh, is disclosed as a part of the document. So the new guidelines really focus on trials, meta-analyses, and observational studies, but um, clearly the um, trials that ha that uh, uh, have been used to uh, put forth today's guidelines are, um, are acknowledge the decades of research to understand the genetics, biochemical, um, uh, animal models, um, and preclinical studies that were used for drug development. Um, and uh, the, I think the important um, relationship that was established in the next slide um, of, of the importance of the of LDL cholesterol and its direct relationship to atherosclerotic um, uh, cardiovascular events is really important. So let's go back to the basis just for a second. So um, the lipoprotein classes um, are there are three major classes, um, two of which are pro-inflammatory LDL, and then the um, triglyceride-rich chylomicrons, very low-density lipoproteins, uh, um, these particles are pro-inflammatory um, as opposed to HDL, which potentially appears to have an anti-inflammatory or favorable um, effect on vascular um, outcomes. 
So the, uh, the role of uh, lipoproteins are, um, in atherogenesis have been um, uh, clearly um, uh, uh, elucidated through research. So you have um, the oxidation of um, LDL, goes, um, which results in macrophage foam cells into the, um, and, uh, the lining, um, endothelial uh, uh, lining of, the, of vessels. And uh, that can either go on to endothelial injury uh, with the continued oxidation, release of PDGF, and advanced fibrocalcific lesion. Um, on the other hand, with HDL, the, and um, uh, there is a uh, process which can uh, uh, capture this oxid oxidized um, um, uh, LDL or foam cells. Um, and uh, bring LDL, uh, very low density uh, lipoproteins, to the liver um, where it's um, metabolized and cholesterol is excreted. So here is a very important uh, risk um, uh, that you see this uh, direct relationship with the, the, um, increasing LDL cholesterol to increasing the risk of heart disease. This is a log scale. So therapies to lower LDL have been identified in the last decade. Today we are going to focus on statin or the 3-hydroxy, 3-methylhydroxyl coenzyme A or HMG CoA reductase inhibitors. Um, this class of drugs has really been tested over the last decade. Um, it has a substantial experience in the population. Its safety um, profile is well known, but most importantly, it has demonstrated benefit in reducing uh, cardiovascular disease events. The other um, cholesterol agents um, have been developed using, um, you know, the best um, information available, but none of the other agents have been shown to, do, uh, to reduce uh, cardiovascular events over that achieved with uh, statin therapy. And so these are, are really not um, recommended They're, they are in the current guidelines. So the um, purpose of the uh, statins, the mechanism of action, is that um, the inhibition of the uh, enzyme uh, of the HMG co um, uh, coenzyme A reductase enzyme in inhibition leads to a reduction in hepatic intracellular cholesterol. The reduction in hepatic cholesterol synthesis lowers intracellular cholesterol that stimulates upregulation of the LDL receptor and increases the uptake of non-HDL par particles from systemic circulation. Um, we also know that um, there's a rule of uh, six um, for statin therapy that doubling of the statin group uh, those produces an additional 6%, just approximate, of reduction in the LDLC level. So let's talk about the new cholesterol guidelines. So as mentioned previously, there's a direct focus on atherosclerotic cardiovascular uh, risk reduction. LDLC and non-HDLC targets are abandoned. This is a sea change from what we have been, uh, have been doing in the last 15 years. Global risk assessment for primary prevention is an important consideration, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There are safety recommendations as part of the guidelines, uh, specifically uh, what, to, what to look for in um, statin therapy. Uh, role of biomarkers and non-invasive tests is also included as part of the um, total uh, information about the patient in determining um, how uh, to approach their uh, treatment. And it's acknowledged that future updates to cholesterol guidelines are expected. So I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the lifestyle and risk assessments. Um, these were separate groups that have reported earlier, but nevertheless, lifestyle modification is the foundation for atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk reduction. So before we talk about statin therapy, it is really important that all Americans, healthy or patients at risk, 
follow uh, lifestyle modification for um, uh, healthy behaviors. So when we talk about heart-healthy diet, there's very strong evidence that we need to reduce salt. Average um, in consumption of salt in this country is um, nearly 3.5 grams. Um, and so uh, reductions are really uh, important. Um, and, um, the, and the other aspect is to um, follow um, heart healthy. These are diets that are rich in fruits and grains, um, low uh, saturated fats, um, but it's a, um, a balanced approach to healthy diet, either the Mediterranean or DASH diet. Regular exercise, including both aerobic and strength building um, routines, for 30 minutes, four times weekly, avoidance of tobacco products, and maintenance of a healthy uh, weight. So understanding these health, um, healthy habits is, is critical. This is a, a, a discussion that a provider should have with every patient, but particularly patients at risk um, and looking for in need of atherosclerotic risk reduction. So let's talk about some of the differences in these new guidelines. So the first thing is that non-statin cholesterol-lowering drugs have fewer trials and lack evidence for significant additional atherosclerotic vascular disease event reduction and therefore are not recommended. The LDLC and non-HDL uh, treatment targets, which have been widely um, drummed into us over the last 15 years are problematic and are no longer recommended. The reason for this change is that clinical trials lack evidence of specific targets. There's no evidence for atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease reduction by differential um, LDLC uh, levels and does not consider um, uh, the uh, adverse uh, effects from multi multiple drugs. Um, Something else that has changed is that lowest is best. This approach is abandoned because of potential adverse events from multi-drug use. And we should remember that the major trial, the Pavastatin trial, approved trial, that led to lower, um, you know, the um, impl implication that lower is best, itself used a high intensity versus a low intensity uh, or moderate intensity uh, level. Not, did not uh, and, uh, intensify therapy based on LDL targets. So, um, again, this, this has been true in the past, but there's just no, really lack of evidence to support this approach. Um, and so treating the level of atherosclerotic risk is very important, and a modified aver a version of this approach has been adopted. Lifetime risk is an appropriate concern, but it was not taken because of the paucity of data on long-term follow-up of randomized trials. Um, so after 15 years, is almost nothing. Um, so an important issue, but um, the risk calculator that we're, we focused on is 10, 10 years now. So there are four major statin benefit groups. Um, so... Um, First, there are patients with, that have atherosclerotic vascular disease. And I should uh, remind you that in, for the purpose of the guidelines, atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease includes coronary heart disease, stroke, and peripheral artery disease. Uh, the second category um, of uh, benefit are patients with primary elevations of their LDL cholesterol um, above 189 milligrams per deciliter. A third at-risk group are diabetics, age 70 to 75, um, and these are patients whose cholesterol may be greater than 70 but below the previous um, uh, 190 target. So these are patients whose risk is not their elevated cholesterol but rather that they have diabetes. Um, and then finally, and this is probably the most controversial um, new uh, risk category, and these are patients aged 40 to 75 years who do not have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or diabetes, but they have a, um, I'm sorry, this is a typo, uh, this should be a 10-year risk score at or above 7.5%. So patients that have a higher risk, um, and uh, we used to think of it as 10% uh, 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 or, or higher, but if you are in this age group, and your 10-year risk score is greater than 7.5%, then 
then you will also you benefit you, you might benefit from statin therapy. There's really good evidence in many of these cases that that will will um, uh, show uh, a greater benefit to risk ratio. Okay. So let's talk about the specific treatment. Treatment strategy is very simple. There's two levels of care, high intensity or moderate intensity statin therapy. And high or low is defined as, um, as examples, um, uh, potent um, uh, uh, statin therapy like lasuvastatin. Uh, at a level of 20 to 40 milligrams, or a torvastatin from, uh, at a level of 80 milligrams. Um, but the intensity comes around this expected reduction of LDLC by approximately 50%. Moderate intensity is using a, 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 a less intense uh, statin therapy to lower the LDLC by 30 to maybe 49% or 50%. But um, if you're at risk, if you're at, in one of the previous four risk categories, the question is whether you should be on a high intensity or a moderate, moderate intensive statin therapy. And I want to underscore, um, we've talked about abandoning targets, but the LDL measures remain important to monitor individual response to therapy and to adherence. So the treatment by statin benefit group, again, patients with atherosclerotic or secondary prevention should be used, should be on high intensity. Um, and um, similarly, patients with uh, LDLC above 190, this is probably your uh, familiar uh, hypercholesterol leaning patients, um, also high intensity. Now, if patients in these categories do not tolerate high intensity, then you should um, um, back away from the highest dose to what is tolerable, but it is preferred to have moderate intensity statin therapy than um, in these groups that otherwise should have high intensity therapy, and you'll see how that affects their LDL, and, um, you know, this would, this, this would be a preferred uh, strategy than adding multiple drugs to achieve some uh, reduction in uh, LDL. Certainly not a target, but, um, again, in these high, the high intensity, one is really thinking for the individual that reducing their LDLC by 50% is, um, would be desirable. So in diabetics, whose risk is that they are diabetic and not the, their level of LDLC, um, moderate intensity statin therapy is recommended. And then, again, in this uh, primary prevention group, patients who do not have atherosclerotic vascular disease and do not have um, elevated LDLC in ages 40 to 75 years um, and who have a um, risk that's greater than 7.5%. Um, depending on that risk, one might choose moderate intensity or high intensity statin therapy. And again, that's as, an, as a strategy, as the actual level and uh, reduction of LDL that you may um, seek with a patient is something that you want to take in consultation, um, uh, understanding the needs and risks of that individual patient. Some of the other considerations for um, trying to determine uh, the best approach for a patient has to do with family history of premature atherosclerotic disease in the, in the first degree relatives, high sensitivity, reactive protein or CRP greater than 2 milligrams per deciliter, um, I'm sorry, 2 milligrams per liter, or um, the presence of calcification on coronary artery calcium scan. So um, let's talk about the safety of um, Statin therapy. Uh, so statins are relatively safe, and I'll, and I'll review that in a second. But there are predisposing conditions to statin toxicity that you should be aware of and, and be reminded of. So multiple serious comorbidities, including impaired renal or hepatic function, are important to remember when, when considering um, dosing and uh, initiating someone on statin therapy. History of previous statin intolerance, unexplained elevations of the uh, liver enzymes, greater than three times the upper limit of normal. Uh, patient factors or drugs that affect statin metabolism age greater than 75 years 
or other other issues such as a history of hemorrhagic stroke or Asian ancestry, which does tend to be um, more sensitive to statin toxicity. Um, so in considering um, the substantial experience with uh, statin therapy, here are the adverse events that we want to be concerned about. Um, so first is this elevated hepatic transaminases. So um, you can see that this is slightly elevated over the control arm, um, but that's something that you want to monitor for. Um, and fortunately, this is a dose-dependent phenomena that is usually reversible. A second issue is, is myalgias. And again, this is um, elevated over a control arm. Um, actually, in, in this particular uh, review, uh, 35 trials, uh, 74,000 patients, you can see the incidence was slightly less. But nevertheless, you want to identify if the myalgia is related to the statin therapy. Um, and again, incidence of myositis is slightly elevated compared to the control arm. And then finally, the, uh, the most um, in, uh, damaging uh, or potentially damaging side effect of uh, statin therapy is uh, rhabdomyolysis, which is a very low um, uh, prevalence, but it's twice what could be seen in the control arm. So this is something we really want to uh, pay attention to. So this is a challenging time for uh, healthcare in the United States. Uh, the 2013 guidelines represent a dramatic change in approach. The resulting guidelines are practical, patient-oriented, focusing on available evidence, the best available ev ev evidence to protect the cardiovascular health of people. This is good for the patient, and it will manage health and managing healthcare costs and disease burden. Future guidelines using quality evidence may address more complex patients. Uh, eliminating health disparities is both doable and a moral imperative. Monitoring outcomes and safety by subgroups with quality improvement oversight is important to achieve the best outcomes. Continued research to examine sex differences in topic physiology and to address subpopulations with greater risk, disproportionate disease burden, and poor outcomes is also needed. Ongoing monitoring of healthcare system differences in the treatment and outcomes of care is important and is the best strategy for health equality. In summary, cardiovascular disease remains a major health and economic burden. Cardiovascular disease treatment has provided benefit to all Americans. Women, and, women, racial, and ethnic minorities are often undertreated. Quality improvement programs narrow treatment gaps. The 2013 ACC AHA cholesterol guidelines focus on reducing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. A risk reduction uh, strategy will benefit heretofore undertreated populations. In conclusion, treatment disparities are reduced with quality improvement oversight. Reducing atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk is central to improving cardiovascular health and reducing cardiovascular-related health care costs. 2013 ACC AHA guidelines to reduce cholesterol, simplify therapy, and focus on reduction of atherosclerotic cardiovascular events. Risk reduction will benefit heretofore undertreated populations. New guidelines and quality improvement programs promise to promote improved cardiovascular outcomes for all Americans. Thank you very much. Dr. Patrice Davey Nickens, we want to thank you very much for that presentation. Um, there sure is a, quite a plethora of information that our attendees can glean knowledge from. Uh, we'd like to now pay attention to the chat because we do have a couple questions. We have about eight minutes left, and if Dr. Patrice, if you could please uh, elaborate on those questions, we appreciate it. Sure. So. Um the first question is, if a patient is currently on moderate therapy, should intensive therapy, um, but should be on intensive therapy, um, and the patient has done well for 15 years, must the regimen be changed? So this is um, clearly um, on the minds of most uh, providers. I've been following someone, and they've been stable. Um, they're doing well. Um, but by the current guidelines, they should be on different therapy. 
So there's nothing in the guidelines that, uh, nothing that, that suggests that you should take a patient that is well controlled and doing, um, over time has done very well, that you should change the regimen. Um, but on the other hand, I would say that uh, for patients that you're having difficulty um, with their treatment, the new guidelines provide an opportunity for a, for a different strategy, to, and the new guidelines do acknowledge tolerance uh, or tolerability as a way of improving adherence. So if you are, um, so the patient who has um, your, the, the uh, initial um, LDLC is 140, and um, they need uh, intensive um, intensive uh, uh, management. And um, if on on statin alone they uh, are reduced to 78 uh, milligrams per deciliter, uh, remembering that their initial strategy was uh, their initial um, baseline was 140, the new guidelines would would um, um, be happy. Uh, this, this is a good reduction, nearly 50 percent, and there would be no consideration, no need to add additional therapies. Um, so, um, you know, again, in the patient in whom you're having difficulty maintaining and, and you, you are concerned about adherence because they're on multiple drugs, um, this, the, the new guidelines offer um, an opportunity to consider change. But, uh, um, again, patients that are doing well do not need to be changed. So um, what happens if the patient does not tolerate intensive statin therapy? Um, so this is an important question because for patients that should be on intensive therapy but do not tolerate it, the second, the next best way to approach them is to keep them on the statin therapy but at the highest dose uh, tolerable. Um, measure their LDL and see where there are. But it would be preferred to have someone on moderate intensity statin therapy with a substantial reduction in their LDLC um, rather than adding multiple drugs. Uh, then finally, uh, what's the impact of the new guidelines? That are, and of course, every that's the uh, uh, the jackpot question. And, um, and, of course, actual impact will be monitored and, and assessed over time. But at this time, it's predicted that many pr patients, perhaps millions more Americans at risk for macular disease, are now considered eligible um, and appropriate for statin treatment in addition to healthy lifestyle to reduce their risk of atherosclerotic events. And I think this will represent a, um, an important opportunity to improve or reduce um, cardiovascular events in, um, in uh, high-risk populations that have been undertreated. Um, uh, is this a question from Sandy Waddell on um, how do you measure the level of rhabdomyolysis? Is it self-supported? Is that, the, is that a question? So um, there is a, so there's uh, various ways to um, monitor for uh, rhabdomyolysis, but this can be uh, quite a severe um, clinical presentation. But you can look for um, evidence in the urine and blood tests, looking for um, elevated uh, creatinine kinase or myoglobin in the, ur in the urine. So um, it's um, the patient will um, have symptoms, but uh, weakness. Uh, uh, change in affect, um, uh, 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 profound tiredness, um, uh, these are things that should alert you. Are there other questions? The ladies and gentlemen on the phone, at this time, if you'd like to ask a question, please press the number one key on your phone. Again, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press the number one key on your phone. There are no questions there? with the phone at this time. Chase, it looks like there are no further questions. We just like to ask that everyone complete the uh, polling questions on your screen, but prior to hanging up. 
Then we also like to thank Dr. Patrice Devine Nickens again for a wonderful presentation. If anyone would like to hear this presentation again, it will be available on our MPRO website within the next two weeks. And feel free to share this presentation with any of your physicians or practices that you work with. Again, thank you to Dr. Nickens, and we look forward to having you on our next webinar, which will be the third Wednesday in December. Thank you very much. My, it was a pleasure. I hope this is helpful. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes your call. Either via the BPMs or our terminology, so there isn't the confusion. I don't want. I don't want to use create deliverables because again, it takes away what we. All the